We're pleased to welcome you to this fifth edition of Corridor Conversations for 2023. It should be the sixth, but we skipped May. I'm Lisa Walker of Hyattsville Aging in Place. Corridor Conversations is sponsored by all of the villages along Route 1, which includes Hyattsville Aging in Place, Helping Hands University Park, Neighbors Helping Neighbors College Park, and Explorations on Aging in College Park. We're very excited to have Gabe Popkin here with us today to talk about food forests and foraging. You know, in March, the quarter conversations uh, featured Dave Rader talking to us about gardening and native plants for health and for the planet. Today, we're going to take that a few steps further, talking with Gabe Popkin about food forests and foraging. As a personal aside, um, a few years ago, my brother-in-law's son stayed with me for the summer. He was an avid gardener and an outdoorsman and started a garden in my backyard, which led me to start my own um, garden plot there and then uh, take a plot in the community garden. We still trade plants. But what I found most fascinating was that over the summer, he became a food forager and would come home with many, many things that he found on his runs around Hyattsville. I'm not sure that Gabe's gonna be able to talk to us about this, but thinking about dangerous mushrooms and whatever, I was always worried that maybe I'd have to tell his parents that he'd been poisoned. Anyway, if Gabe may be able to tell us something about that, he may not, but he is a science writer and an amateur naturalist and forager in Mount Rainier. He has written about wild foods for the Washington Post Magazine for National Geographic and other publications. He grows edible plants in his yard and in a food forest in a public park in Mount Rainier. And he wrote an article, which we're gonna put in the chat um, about foraging last August, I believe, which um, you can download or that Carter will make available um, after this session. We're excited to have you join us today, Gabe. Um, so go ahead, take it away. Great, thank, thank you so much. Um, so I just wanna, start out with first thank uh carter for inviting me to talk um and to, i think I, I hope for uh being okay with a, a sort of a talk that just kind of combines a bunch of thoughts that i've had about this topic over the years i mean i will talk about the mount rainier food forest course um but just kind of a very sort of open-ended talk i, I don't want to talk too long um i I think I'll just talk a little bit and then we can hopefully have a conversation. Um, and I also want to say that I'm, I'm very much, I feel like I'm, I'm very much a learner in this space. I uh, probably have way more to learn than I've learned. Um, so I'm not trying to come present myself as some sort of expert giving a, a Ted talk or something. This is more of a conversation. Maybe I'll learn from you all, new new things that I don't know. And, um, you know, I hope we can just all learn together and sort of in the, in the service of making our landscapes more diverse, more useful to us, more edible, just more beautiful, more better in, in mm -hmm. every way. Um, so I'm going to try to share my screen and hope that it works. My computer's being a little bit slow. PowerPoint going, I just threw together. Is it working? Yep, it's great. Great. Um, hopefully the slideshow comes up. Food forests and foraging along Route 1. Um, and I'm interpreting Route 1 kind of broadly here. Go US 1 goes all the way from Miami to Maine, as probably most of you know. So mm. we could be talking about all of that, but we won't. Um, so I thought I'd talk, re rather than get into food forests right away, um, maybe take a step back and think about the whole idea of wild food, which I sort of define as any food that you don't buy, basically. Um, and now most of us, of course, like for 99% of human history, this was all food, um, or most food. Nowadays, it's kind of almost we've gone so much in the direction of purchasing our food that it's almost 
weird to think about food, not, you know, eating anything that we don't buy from a grocery store um, or a farmer's market or online increasingly nowadays. Um, you know, something that we just like literally go outside and like pluck from our yard or some other public space. Um, but I just want to do want to remind people that this is the way people ate, ate from the time the humans first evolved. Um, and it's a very kind of common, it's still, it's still common in many parts of the world, um, even many wealthy countries, maybe a, a little bit less so in the US um, these days. And it's, uh, if, you, if you do take a few common sense precautions, it's, it can be very safe, um, it can be very fulfilling. Um, and I, I thought I'd start just kind of sharing a few thoughts about why, why do this since we, you know, in the, in the, this day and age, it's true that we do all have the option of going to the grocery store and, and buying food. Um, inflation notwithstanding, food is, is very cheap in this country. Um, so you might ask, why even bother like going out and getting food from, from, from the wild, from nature? And, and when, I, when I say the wild and nature, I'm not just talking about like, you know, Shenandoah National Park. I mean, like, you know, the neighborhood park, even like um, maybe the tree box uh, next to your house. I'm, I'm being very expansive about this. So I, I, I think I've, I've thought about a number of reasons that resonate with me. And I'm interested to hear a little bit later if folks have other reasons. But um, I think one, one reason that really com is compelling to me is that um, there's, there's about this estimated 7,000 species of, of edible plants in the world. And if you think about what you might find at a grocery store, even like a, a good grocery store, like uh, Whole Foods, you might find, you might be lucky to find 70 species in the, um, in the vegetable department. It, you may be aware that um, a lot of a lot of our vegetables are the same species. Austin, who does the food talks, the different talks in Mount Can you hear my mm -hmm. okay. um, So even a lot of our vegetables are are sort of different versions of the same species. Um, so it, it's a pretty narrow range that we're able to actually purchase. And if you want to kind of explore the whole world of edible plants, you you do need to get out there and and um, you know, go beyond the grocery store and start finding plants in your environment. So that's one thing. I just think it, it exposes us. It gives us an opportunity to eat a much larger variety of, of things. Um, it turns out many of these wild plants are extremely healthy. So all the foods that we buy at the store, they've um, generally been bred over time um, by, by plant breeders. And this goes back millennia in some, in many cases, and they're usually not being bred for, nutrition, but rather for things like size, uh, appearance, um, fast growth. So in, in many cases, the um, sort of nutritional qualities of the original species, the wild type species has, have been lost or diluted. Um, oops, let me get rid of that. And, um, and so if we go out, if we, if we forage, we're actually able to access um, kind of much you know, species that are much closer to the way they evolved originally. And these are often very healthy, very, you know, full of phytonutrients. Um, what I'm showing you in this photo is an example of, of one of these plants. It's called Sochan. That's, that's the Cherokee name for it. It's also often called cutleaf coneflower. That's more like the landscaping name of it. And it's a very common plant. You may well have it in your yard. It's almost certainly growing in a, in a park near you. And it's um, in the spring, when it looks like this in the photo, it's, it's edible and, and delicious. You can eat it raw. You can take it home and cook it like kale. Um, so that's just like one example of, of, um, of this huge variety of edible plants that, that are growing around us. Um, I think another reason I, I like to eat wild foods is just it gives me a new way to engage uh, with my environment. So if I just go out for a hike, I could easily just walk five, 10 miles and almost notice nothing. But if I'm 
looking at the landscape for things that I could potentially eat, it just makes my hike so much more interesting. Um, I find that I slow down. I notice way more things, even if I don't end up eating very much, I'm, I'm engaging way more of my brain and my senses in, in this whole experience. Um, so those, those are three reasons. Um, and I'm sure there are more that we can talk about. Um, I guess one more I would just add is that a lot of these foods are, are really delicious. Um, this is, I guess my next question is where to find wild foods. And my answer is everywhere. So I walked out of my house this morning and noticed this little wood sorrel plant growing among the bricks in my front stoop. Um, so you don't need to go to, again, like the national forest or some huge park. Um, I do notice a bird tried to, looks like it was, a bird tried to fertilize this plant there. Uh, <laughs> um, so you always want to be, you know, careful you're not eating something you don't want to be eating. Um, but wild foods, m many of our kind of common weeds that we don't even try to grow, sometimes we may not even want to be growing in our yards, are turn out to be edible and actually quite good. So this wood sorrel here, it looks like clover, except that the leaves are heart shaped rather than like one smooth edge. Um, that's a, it's, it's a pretty delicious, um, kind of got a nice lemony sour taste to it. Um, you can throw it in your salad and you can find it perhaps growing in your uh, front porch or sidewalk or whatever. Um, so you can find wild foods everywhere. This is a uh, red bud flower from my yard earlier this spring. Um, red buds grow everywhere. It's, you don't have to try very hard to find one. And if you just look around at the right time of year, kind of early spring, um, the, these flowers are edible. Another really nice thing to throw in your, um, in your salad. This is a persimmon tree that grows just a few blocks from my house. Um, I discovered it, my, my heart partner and I discovered it um, during the pandemic when we were doing lots of walks and you know, investigating every single block of our environment because there was nothing else to do. Um, so I, I like this photo because it shows that wild foods, even without anybody really trying, can be extremely abundant. Um, these are, this is an American persimmon, uh, which is a native tree that grows in our area. And I don't know how this tree got to this park, um, but I'm quite certain that nobody is really paying much attention to it. And yet it produces hundreds and hundreds of really delicious, really nutritious, completely free fruits every fall without anybody making any effort. Um, and if somebody made a little bit of effort, we could this park could probably be growing 10 times as many of these persimmons. So it's not like these things are rare. It's not like these things are really hard to, to grow. Um, they're just kind of all around us and we just often don't pay attention to them. And this is kind of the result of our foraging. So we have, uh, I guess, three, four jars of persimmon pulp, which is enough for many different desserts and then a whole bunch of fruits that we can just eat on our own. Anyone who knows anything about persimmon, you know that you, you kind of want to eat it at the right moment when it's like start, sort of starts to squish in your fingers. If you eat it before then, when it's not quite ripe, you're going to get a really astringent taste in your mouth. It's not dangerous, but it's also not pleasant. Um, and if you wait too long, then it just turns to mush and you're not going to want to eat it anymore. So you do need to kind of get it at the right moment, which we were fortunate to do. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to this idea of a food forest, which is sort of, you know, I, I don't think of it as totally separate from foraging from nature. It's just almost like a way of enhancing nature so that we can make our foraging a little bit more productive and easier. Um, but I thought I'd introduce the concept by looking at some different definitions of food forest um, that I found on the internet. So one of them is a land use system in which, oops, didn't mean to do that. Sorry, uh, trees, shrubs, can I make myself go away so I can see the whole screen? There we go. Trees, shrubs, and agricultural crops are interspersed. Um, 
so I think that's, you know, I think there's something interesting there, which is that it's not, when we think about forest, the term forest, we often just think about trees and that's it. But a forest is much more than that. The trees are sort of the, the top layer, the canopy, some of the understory, midstory as well. But there's also shrubs, which are plants that don't get as tall as a tree, um, sometimes defined as five meters. And then there's um, even smaller things, things that aren't woody at all. Um, these could be um, some of our kind of common vegetables. They could be other sorts of herbaceous plants that are edible. And the idea in a food forest is to mix these all together to get as much stuff growing and as, as diverse uh, a set of plants growing as possible. Um, so that kind of brings us to our next definition, a diverse planting of edible plants that attempts to mimic the ecosystems and patterns found in nature. So this is you know, interesting as well because I've, I've worked on some farms in the past and I've done a lot of vegetable gardening. And typically when, you, when one farms or even gardens, we often plant in straight rows. We often plant just kind of one thing at a time, like you get your tomatoes here and your kale here, there. Um, and this is, as we know, like not the way nature does things. Nature tends to mix things up. Um, so food forests um, often do that. Um, it, it may mean that kind of your overall yield is, is, is a little bit less than in a sort of production system that's maximized for just pure yield, but um, you get a much more diverse uh, various types of food um, out of it. Um, a garden that mimics the structures of a natural forest with multiple layers of plants stacked verti vertically to increase overall production. Um, so, yeah, again, you know, very different from the way we think about a farm where you just typically have one layer of plants. You have your, your cornfield and there, you don't want anything growing above your corn because it's going to shade the corn and make your corn yield less. That's absolutely not the way we think when we're doing food forests. Um, in food forests, you, you want to kind of use all the space, all the vertical space. It does mean that your, your yield, yield of things growing on the ground is probably going to be a little bit less than if you were, um, in sort of in a typical monoculture production system, but you, we accept that, um, because we get this benefit of having a much more diverse, um, and also kind of ecologically healthy and useful um, ecosystem. A low, this is what Wikipedia says, a low maintenance, sustainable plant-based food production and agroforestry system. I won't read the rest of it, but I did want to kind of highlight those first two adjectives, low maintenance and sustainable. Um, annuals have to be planted every year. Uh, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of water. To, you have to fertilize every year if you wanna maintain production. Um, in a food forest, you don't need to do any of that. You do have to water initially, obviously, to get things established. But after that, um, you know, trees and woody plants and perennials should be able to more or less take care of themselves um, kind of once they're established. I, I will caveat that by saying, noting that because it was so dry recently, um, we did go and water the Mount Rainier food forest a bit. Um, so it's not, I, it, you know, this, this says low maintenance, it's definitely not no maintenance, but um, you know, certainly less than you might expect for a, a typical vegetable garden. And then this last definition, part of the broader food justice and urban agriculture movement so that's sort of a different kind of definition. It's not so much like what's growing in the food forest, but sort of how it's situated, how this idea has become situated in our society. Um, food forest, you know, in a way it's sort of a, a return to the way that people produce plants um, going back to the beginning of agriculture and even before what we, we typical, typically think of as agriculture. Um, but because we have moved so far away from uh, thinking about forests as food production systems, we, we now sort of, it, it, it almost needs to have a sort of conscious movement behind it um, to get us 
kind of to incorporate this way of producing food back into our, our society. So um, there is, I, I would say, sort of a loose movement um, around food forests. It um, sort of overlaps with permaculture, but um, I think permaculture has some, you know, sometimes somewhat different aims, and it's not something that I know very much about or feel qualified to speak about. Um, and then food justice. So what, one of the, um, you know, I earlier alluded to the fact that we're pretty much all become used to buying our food, but that means we're sort of, you, you know, kind of forced to p participate in the, the capitalist economy if we, if we want to acquire our food that way. So there is this idea that uh, food forests can offer sort of an alternative to that. I, I, I think it would be very difficult, at least living in a sort of urban suburban setting to uh, supply yourself completely with food from uh, from the wild or from food forests, but it, it can certainly play a component, um, you know, I think really enhance nutrition in particular, maybe not provide like the bulk of our calories, but certainly provide some nutrients um, that can be harder to obtain from sort of commercially grown food. So there's some thoughts about the food forests in general. Um, about so it's 2023. So about four years ago, I and some other folks in, in Mount Rainier, Maryland started talking about what we could do with this park, this sort of small, maybe one acre city park that just kind of had nothing going on. It was just a lawn. So if you look at this photo and then imagine nothing there except the grass and the weeds, that's what we were looking at about four years ago. Um, I had been spending some time at this place called Forested, which is run by a guy named Lincoln Smith, um, who is actually should be giving this talk because he's been doing food forest for 10 plus years and full time, and whereas I'm more of a dabbler. But um, anyhow, he that's where I kind of learned about this idea of the food forest. And it just sort of all clicked for me. Like we have this kind of use, useless sort of wasted space in the middle of our city. Um, why don't we plant a bunch of edible plants there? And I proposed this to, I brought, to a council member, uh, Luke Kesick, as well as some other folks I knew who were just kind of enthusiastic about landscaping and, and plant native plants. And um, the idea got some momentum behind it. Um, it did take a little bit of time. I'll, I'll get to that maybe a little bit more in a minute in terms of we had to sort of work with this, both the city and uh, the Parks and Planning Department, the County Parks and Planning to sort of get there okay with the idea. We had some community meetings and in the spring 2020, we were ready to start planting. Of course, spring 2020 is also when the whole world turned upside down. So um, the, the Mount Rainier food forest basically dates to the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and it was a really a great thing to, to be able to do at that time. Um, probably for obvious reasons. Um, so it's about a one acre space um, and it's divided into a number of different beds. You can see here several of those beds. And the idea is um, to plant pretty densely so that to completely fill the space, hopefully not get a lot of weeds that we have to deal with. And so that um, the plants, sort of the taller trees and plants provide shade um, and, and you know, minimize the amount of watering that's going to be needed over time and, and that get, get at that vertical structuring idea that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, these are, th these beds are designed, so as the water, so, so the uphill is to the left and downhill is to the right. And as the water flows, the idea is that it would collect behind these berms and sort of soak in to the, um, to the beds, which, you know, also means hopefully that we won't have to worry as much about watering. Um, and, you know, stormwater is a big thing. Everyone's trying to reduce the amount of stormwater going into the sewers. Um, and so th this, um, our, our design was also intended to sort of provide that secondary benefit. Um, I will say that this, the reason this space was open is that it actually used to have a stream flowing through it. Um, at one point, my understanding is that it flooded. Uh, people didn't like that. So the stream was buried in a pipe, which goes under this um, park. Um, 
but you know we did leave the the center of the park open in the hopes that maybe that stream could be daylighted someday, which would provide the opportunity to perhaps grow some riparian and wetland plants that um, that and and we do also have down at the bottom of the hill, not really shown in this photo, a, a sort of a we call it the pawpaw patch. It's sort of the lowest, wettest part of the garden, and it's where we um, incorporated a bunch of plants that li like shade and water, including pawpaws, elderberries, um, trying to think what else. Sweet bay magnolia, not really an edible plant, but um, so what, what I see here, um, you know, I, I want to kind of make the point that we, we're not when choosing our plants, we didn't just kind of obsessively focus on, okay, everything has to produce something edible to humans. Um, because then you would have almost more like a, a, an orchard. Not that there's anything wrong with orchards, but we wanted to sort of have a more expansive vision. So we have, I see on the left here, this is a service berry tree. Um, uh, in theory, produces some edible berries in the spring. In reality, they tend to get covered in fungus before uh, we get to them oftentimes. Um, I think I see some hazelnut, a hazelnut um, that should eventually produce some some edible nuts. Um, I see, I think, nan nanking cherry. Um, I see a kind of mint um, growing on the ground there. And then I also see goldenrod, which is not an edible plant for us, but is a, a great plant for pollinators. Um, I think I see some Monarda or bee balm in the bed behind the, the, the one that's most in front. Um, milkweed, uh, I think that's milkweed. I know we have milkweed in the garden. Milkweeds, as probably most people know, a essential plant for monarch butterflies and also just a great plant for pollinators in general. Um, linden, linden trees produce um, edible flowers and leaves for us, but they also produce um, th their flowers are, are really useful for bees. Um, and we have a lot of beekeepers in the neighborhood. So we're producing food for humans. We're also producing food for non-humans. Um, and I do wanna just point out this little sign here. Um, you probably can't read it, but I think it's a really important element of the food forest because it's, we, we could have just thrown a bunch of plants in here and said, all right, we did our job. Uh, we created a food forest. But since food forests are a kind of unusual thing in our, our world today, we wanted to make sure, and, and obvious, and the people, you know, those of us, the group of us that planted this, we're not just going to be standing at the food forest all the time, able to welcome people and sort of orient them. We wanted to make sure that when the public came to this park, they knew what they were looking at. So we actually, I think we spent more money on on signage and we did on the plants themselves. Um, and that way, anybody coming to this park can um, kind of learn, first of all, what it is, sort of the, the philosophy behind it, but also the fact that, yes, this, this is producing food and that they are welcome to eat anything that they find in the food forest. Because I think that's a, an important and probably not obvious point is, is that um, this is for the public. Um, this is just an example of a, a, I think, the kind of plant that I think, you know, really highlights what we're trying to do here. This is black chokeberry or Aronia, melana, Aronia melanocarpa. Um, so black chokeberry is a native plant, but the sort of wild type version of it produces these small, very bitter berries. Um, there's a reason it's called chokeberry. And I, I eat them. I, I have the native wild chokeberry in my yard. I eat a few every year, but it's never going to catch on. Like, as it's just, they're just too astringent. Um, so, Aronia melanocarpa, I, I believe, is our native black chokeberry uh, crossed with a uh, more um, kind of edible type. Um, and so, it produces bigger berries that are more palatable. Um, I wouldn't go so far as, they're, they're certainly not super sweet. Um, it's, I think, more of an acquired taste or maybe something you'd want to mix in your smoothie um, with, with some other berries. Um, 
but they're incredibly dense in um, antioxidants, extremely healthy, and they grow really well in our area. So um, this is just, um, you know, the type of plant that I think really, you know, a food forest can really kind of introduce to people that they may not be able to access otherwise. Uh, there was a grower, a small grower in the Eastern shore who was trying to grow these and selling them at mom's, but I haven't seen them in the last year. So I think he may have given up, unfortunately. Um, so I've, I've talked almost exclusively about plants, um, but I did want to note that mushrooms are also something that grow in food forests. Not, not so much because we introduce them, but just when you put a bunch of wood uh, in a place, you get mushrooms. Um, it's pretty amazing. Now, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not in any way a mushroom expert. And that's kind of why I'm a little hesitant to talk too much about them. Because um, as most people probably know, you really need to know what you're doing when you go out and forage mushrooms. And I don't know if all these mushrooms I'm showing here are edible. Um, probably some of them are not. And they didn't all come from the food forest either. They were part of this uh, a, a mushroom work ID workshop that we held there last year. But um, it sort of highlights the point to me that the food forest has become a place where people bring food uh, for various reasons as well, whether to have a picnic or also to learn more about it. Um, and there certainly have been edible mushrooms that have grown in the food forest. Uh, oyster mushrooms, there's chicken of the wood growing there right now. Um, I'm pretty sure we've also, we had a shiitake log inoculation workshop. I haven't actually seen any shiitakes, but uh, growing, but maybe hopefully we will get some eventually. Um, I know I'm forgetting things too. So um, I just kind of want to make the point that mushroom, mushrooms are just kind of grow and they're, they're part of what we can sort of um, take advantage of with the important caveat that we need to know what we're doing. Um, this is a photo from our mushroom ID workshop. And I, I just like the fact that it, it sort of makes the point that the food forest is a place for people. Um, uh, before we planted anything there, I, the only activity I ever saw anyone do there was walk their dog. Um, since we started the food forest, I would say the human use of the park has gone up maybe a hundred times. That's just a, a wild estimate. Um, and part of that is because we've, we've created programming. Um, and part of, a lot of that is just because it's become a much more uh, attractive and interesting place to be. And uh, lastly, or not lastly, but um, just to kind of drive that point home that it's not just about food for people, um, but by, by planting things in sort of, um, you know, trees, shrubs, understory plants, and lots of diversity, you, you start to see uh, all kinds of different wildlife using the, the food forest from, uh, from bees, um, butterflies, birds. Um, we have had um, some deer visiting, which is sort of a, you know, deer are native species here. They also make it hard to grow things. So it's a, a mixed blessing. Um, don't know if that bear made it down to our food forest, but if it did, I'm sure it would have found something there, something to enjoy there. Um, so this isn't a plant, obviously, but um, this is one of the things I'm most pleased about. We worked with a local artist, Tori Partridge, to create this sign, which if you, if you visit our food forest, you will see it's right there at the front of the park. And I think it's just such a beautiful um, introduction to the, both the food forest itself and the whole idea, philosophy behind food forest, with everything from edible plants, mushrooms, um, to the, you know, you can learn a little bit about the birds, native birds of our area, native insects, and the idea that you need different plants um, to support different kinds of insects. There's just a lot, a lot there, and it's all, I think, um, just done in this really beautiful way. Um, I'm so used to just going to, to parks and seeing sort of signs that um, aren't very inspiring. And then over the years, they kind of get um, degraded by the sun and, and they're just like, don't really give you a very exciting feeling about 
using the the park. And I I think this this sign is my favorite um, sort of park sign that I've I've ever seen anywhere. Um, what else? So this wasn't something that we were thinking about when we started the food forest, but shortly after we started it, um, a, a huge oak tree had to come down in in somebody's yard in Mount Rainier. And I, I won't take any credit for this, but somebody had the idea let's, of cutting that tree into um, different, different size and shape pieces and putting it in the food forest. So this is, um, these are two guys who actually grew up in Mount Rainier and um, work, worked for a tree company or actually started their own tree and landscaping company. And they were willing to volunteer their time to create um, a seating area, a wood seating area, as well as a um, wood or a stump playground, uh, which I'll show a little bit in the next slide. And I just think it's a really cool way that the food forest, the, the existence of the food forest has started stimulating new ideas that probably nobody would have had before. And those ideas ended up enhancing the space in ways that, um, you know, those of us who kind of originally came up with a concept never never would have thought about because we were so focused on like, okay, what plants should go in here and how should they be arranged, et cetera, et cetera. So I just thought that was really neat. Um, this is the sort of the early version of the stump playground. It actually looks quite different today. And it sort of evolves over time because this, this is wood, wood decays. It's just a natural process. Um, so the playground is always evolving and changing and eventually it probably won't exist anymore unless we get some new new pieces. Um, but I will say that I think that the the sort of stump playground and seating area have become the most popular parts of the food forest because you know kids love them, families love them, it's sort of obvious how to use them. Um, so I think it's you know, even though I would love to think like every everybody wants to come and learn about edible and native plants, like some people and kids and adults who are kids at heart want um, something to jump on and, and run on and, and things like that. So it's good to like provide um, a lot of different things for a lot of different users in a food forest. Um, this, this was a um, sort of a something that was created for beans to grow on. And I, I I think it makes a point that it's also worth um, it's worth thinking about incorporating annuals, even though annuals, you know, typically are not native to this region, um, or at least they're sort of not the wild type plants that, that grew native in our region, but they have a number of advantages that they grow fast, they produce food in a few months rather than a few years or many years. Um, and they, they sort of they can sort of enhance the um, the perennials and the woody uh, plants that they grow in a food forest. So this was early in the season. By the end of the season, the beans had completely covered that that structure. Um, the downside of annuals is that they they they're gone in a few months, and if you want them next year, you have to replant. So I don't think we have replanted beans since that initial year, but it's something that we could do um, in the future. Um, since this is about Route 1, um, these are some other food forests that I'm aware of along Route 1. Hyattsville has two food forests, both in public space. Um, very cool. Those were, I, I believe, um, designed by Lincoln Smith, who I mentioned earlier, and implemented by the city itself, which is a little bit different from what we did. Um, in our case, the, the food forest was entirely designed and planted by by volunteer residents. Um, the city has helped us purchase some plants and um, the public works department mows between the beds, but as far as um, planting, maintaining, watering, et cetera, et cetera, that's entirely been done by us residents. So um, it's important, you know, if you're thinking about doing a food forest to think about kind of what the capacity is of different groups, whether it's like the, the paid employees of a city versus uh, volunteer residents who who's, has the expertise and is going to be able to, to, to provide what's needed. Um, I, I know there are food forests in College Park and Greenbelt. I haven't actually been to them. I can't say very much about them. Maybe someone 
during the Q&A, we can hear more about them. And if there are others um, out there, I'd, I'd certainly be interested to hear about them. Um, so the original inspiration, I, I believe, for all of these food forests, certainly ours, was uh, Forested, which is out in Bowie, uh, sort of eastern Prince George's County. Sorry, just going to have some water. And if you're interested in food forests, it's absolutely worth uh, making the trek out there. It's only about a half hour drive. And it's, um, you know, you can see a food forest that's much farther along um, in, its, in its development. Um, this guy, Lincoln Smith, has been at it for 10 years, I think actually 11 years now. And he's got way more land than we do. And he's just uh, been able to invest way more into it. Um, so it's just kind of really amazing what he's, he's been able to do um, in terms of bringing in edible plants from all over the world, things that most of us have never even heard of and sort of try out like what grows well in this area, um, what produces a lot. <clears throat> um, oftentimes the, it, you, 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 may, you sort of get the most food or the best food, maybe not always from the wild type plant, but from a cross between the wild plant and a cultivated variety. You can, you can often get the, the best of both worlds and Lincoln has been doing a lot of experimentation in, uh, along those lines. So look up forested.us. He has regular um, field trips. He has volunteer days. He has forest feasts. I'd highly recommend checking it out. Um, I did want to um, just kind of make a, a point, something I think about a lot, is that if, if we like restrict our con concept of food forest to public parks where somebody has planted something and then given it a name like the Mount Rainier food forest, um, that, that's pretty restrictive. That, that's going to limit us to just a few acres in our entire landscape. Um, but if we think about a food forest being any place where um, trees or any plants grow in public space that produce something edible, we can start seeing our, our cities, our urban forests as food forests. Um, so this is a block, this is actually just one block north of me in Mount Rainier. Um, about five, six years ago, when I was on the Mount Rainier Tree Commission, um, we planted this block. So there were, you know, before that, it was just a big lawn between the sidewalk and the, and the road. Um, we put in probably 20, 25 trees. Uh, the city then later came in and added these rain gardens. And it's just made the block so much more beautiful over time, it's gonna become much more shady. Um, and, you know, even though we weren't really thinking about edible plants at the time, I noticed we've got a linden tree here. Um, there's some oaks further down, um, some red bud. We could have thought about serviceberry and other things. I just think there's so much potential for growing edible um, trees and plants all over the place. And we just, in, in places that we just typically don't even think about. Um, of course, I, I, you know, I can't help but point out on the left side of the sidewalk is a big, mostly empty lawn that belongs to the apartment complex. They could also be having a, growing a food forest there if they wanted to. Um, okay, how to create a food forest. It doesn't just create itself, unfortunately. I think if, if we had just convinced the city to stop mowing this park, it probably would have pretty quickly grown up in a bunch of invasive plants that we don't really want. Um, so you do need to, it does take intentional effort um, to select the, the plants that we actually want to have growing in a place um, and then sort of plant them in a way that they will grow well together. Um, and then you have to water like my friend Barry is doing here. Um, and the point, you know, one point I think this photo makes is that food forests require people. Um, we think about forests in general as just places that just grow um, like it's our, it's our native vegetation here. We don't need to do anything. Um, that's not really accurate in any case, but it's certainly not accurate for a food forest. Um, so definitely, if you want to have a food forest, um, you need to get a group of people who are going to be able to create that food forest and then maintain it over time. Um, here are some things that, that are important to think about. Um, 
who owns the land is it i mean the sort of most basic um kind of division there would be public or private i think they both have advantages and disadvantages public land um you know i think at this point our public land holdings are pretty stable so i don't i don't worry about this public land kind of going out of it being sold i don't think that's going to happen at this point um on the other hand it means that there's bureaucrats who are often afraid of new things so um city of mount rainier was quite easy to work with but maryland national capital parks and planning took a little bit more convincing because basically we're coming to them and saying we want to do something completely different with this space and um and yet you know we'll maintain it but they might be asking questions like well are you going to maintain it how long are you going to maintain it um and are we going to be and you know end up saddled with having to maintain this when when all the original people move away or lose interest or something like that so um you know private land obviously you need the permission of the landholder um but it can be you know if it's owned by like a, a foundation or philanthropy or something like that it, you know i think also could be a, a good option um you know one thing i do think about is that you know we're, we're all going to be gone someday if you want to grow a, a food forest like these trees in particular take tens of years to really reach maturity so you want something that is not you know just going to be sold or turned over to some other use in a few years it's really not worth trying planting a food forest in a place like that in my opinion um sorry i'm gonna let my cat out of the room okay um what plants will grow well i can tell you one plant that has not grown well for us which is blueberry um when i think about where blueberry grows in nature it's it, it tends to be in open areas often with poor soil um i know that blueberry really benefits from fire and um you know i think about a classic blueberry habitat as um, dolly sods in west virginia where there's no no real overstory it's just sort of this open um landscape and it um blueberry is well known for for wanting acidic soil that's quite a bit more acidic than than other plants typically want so we we planted some blueberries and i think they've performed sort of the worst of all our plants or among the worst um so that's kind of one lesson learned is that depending where you are it, it may not make sense to grow every possible edible plant you can think of um, you want to grow stuff that is going to you know fit with your soil type um, the amount of water you have um, things like that um, i'm just going to check my time here oh we're going through the time quickly um, i'll try to wrap up soon where will you get your plants from edible landscaping is a great company down near charlottesville um, lots of native plant nurseries or even not not exclusively native plant nurseries also sell um, edible plants so there's a wide variety um, i will also make note that there are a number of grants that are out there i think incre increasing numbers of grants in fact that are out there that can fund this we got a grant from the maryland urban forestry i'm not going to remember the full name i think it was mu cfc um, that was the acronym um, but you know with everybody wanting to fund tree plantings and stormwater mitigation. There's just a lot of options out there. Um, and plants are not that expensive in the, in the long term, in the, in the big picture. Um, there was another group in Mount Rainier that was trying to work on a different park and they had this whole sort of landscape design with hardscaping. Um, it was, they, they needed $50,000 to, to get started and they have not gotten started yet. Um, so one, one thing I think that made our food forest successful is that it was cheap. Um, mulch, deer fencing, just other things, um, you're going to want, um, how will you water that? That's a tough one. Um, this park doesn't have a water source, but there was a fire hydrant nearby. And so we were able to borrow a tool that enabled us to use the fire hydrant for watering. Without that, we would have been reliant on neighbors and 
you know, then you get into people, you know, people's water bills going way up um, if you're relying on them throughout the summer. So that's, that's just something important to think about. Um, another option we considered was a, a cistern that could have been perhaps filled by the public works department. Um, who will maintain the food forest two, five, 10, 25, 100 years from now? I'm joking about the 100 years. There's no way for us to plan that far out. But just the point is that this isn't something you just like put in and then you know, walk away and, and assume that it will just take care of itself after that. Um, I sort of made a mental uh, a commitment that as long as I live in Mount Rainier, I'm going to be involved with the, the Mount Rainier food forest. Um, I can't speak for anyone else about that. Um, but I think it is important just to think about how do you establish um, a group that will be committed to this space? Because I, I just, I've seen so many times when somebody, you know, a group got really enthusiastic about planting something, trees or native plants, but there wasn't that follow up. And I think we all know what happens. It just kind of the, the invasive plants in our area are, are so strong that they, they will just take over. Um, and how will you let the public know? Because as I said earlier, a food forest, it's not something we're used to these days. So there is a sort of this education component to it. Um, and we actually invested quite a bit in, in that, as I mentioned before. Um, if you're sort of selling this idea to like public, you know, a city or county government, um, the idea that you're going to provide food to residents might sound a little odd. It might not convince everybody. So I think about these sort of co-benefits. Um, you can also point out increased biodiversity. So we went from a lawn with probably a few non-native species in it to, I would guess, although I haven't counted lately, more than 100 species, uh, mostly native in, in our food forest. Um, biodiversity is a big, a big thing. Everybody wants more biodiversity now. So that, that could be one selling point. Um, it's more attractive and useful landscapes for people, uh, wildlife and pollinators. Uh, water is a big deal. We all, um, you know, it's become pretty clear that as climate change continues that for our region, perhaps the number one impact is going to be stronger um, storms where th that might dump several inches of water in a very short period of time. And that really puts a lot of stress on our sewer systems, our waterways. So um, if you're growing a forest, that is going to be the best way to capture some of that water and keep it out of our, or, you know, prevent flooding, um, prevent overloading our sewer systems. Um, enhanced human happiness and health and well-being. Um, this is that's the kind of thing that's a little harder to quantify, but I think it's really important. So I um, put it in there. Um, you know, again, we're, people, climate change is on people's minds and a lot of people are thinking about carbon sequestration. I don't think that uh, one acre of forest is going to sequester a, an amount of carbon that's really going to make a difference for the global climate, but it's certainly something that I think a lot of people are thinking about, so it never hurts to mention it. Um, so I'm, I'm expanding a little bit now from food forests, going back to this, this, this idea of eating wild foods in general, whether they come from a food forest or elsewhere. Um, you know, I think it's, I'm not going to be able to teach you how to forage just in a, in a quick Zoom talk, but um, there are a lot of foraging guides out there. There are um, books, websites, there are people who lead foraging walks. It's very easy to find this stuff online. And I think, um, you know, I think everyone should feel empowered to, to go out and start, you know, viewing our landscapes as places to find food. But as was mentioned earlier, there, there is this idea, there is this, you know, there is a certain amount of risk involved because most of us didn't grow up learning about all our uh, native um, edible plants and, and certainly much less mushrooms. Um, so you do need to be sure you know what you're eating and that can come from having a, a, a knowledgeable expert teaching you um, it can com come from having a good guide and really kind of using that guide rigorously. Don't just sort of like say, ah, oh, that looks close enough, but really pay attention to the characteristics of what you're thinking about eating. Um, 
I will say that plants present less of a risk than mushrooms. There are, there are certainly plants out there that can make us sick. Um, and there are a few species that grow around here that, that could be really dangerous. But the vast majority of our plants, even if you, if you eat a small amount, is not going to kill you. Um, with mushrooms, I, that's, it's certainly true that the majority of our mushrooms are not fatally toxic, but enough of them are that you just don't want to take any chances ever with mushrooms. You, you absolutely must know what you're eating. And so I don't really eat any mushroom unless I have someone I trust telling me what it is. Um, is there enough that you can take what you want and or need and leave enough for everyone else too? And by everyone else, I mean both other people and wildlife. Um, I showed that plant Sochan earlier. To me, that's, you know, that's a plant that grows very strongly. Um, if you take a few stalks from the outer edges of a clump of Sochan, it'll, you, you will actually, according to Cherokee um, traditional ecological knowledge, you will actually be helping that plant grow stronger by sort of stimulating new growth. So that's, so you need to know the, the sort of growth habit of the plant that you're foraging. Um, and that will tell you, kind of guide you in, in how much can you take, sort of how should I forage? Um, it's, you know, if you have a clump of something, you don't want to just like grab everything from one piece of the clump, part of the clump, but uh, maybe take a stock here, a stock there. Um, Ramps is another big one. Um, it's a really delicious edible type of onion that grows in the spring, but it's not super abundant. So you really want to be making sure that you, first of all, you're not digging up the root so that the plant can grow back after you forage it. And secondly, you, you don't want to take too much from any one patch. Um, generally, you want to try to forage in a way that enhances rather than harms the ecosystem. Um, so one way, you know, I think about those persimmons I showed earlier, if, if we did no foraging, that tree would dump, drop all its persimmons right there at the base. At, at the base. Um, some of them would be eaten by deer. The deer would probably then go poop the seeds out a little bit farther from the tree and that might help some new trees grow. But we, um, you know, take the fruits home, um, separate the seeds and the pulp, and then all the seeds go into our compost. And then the compost gets spread around the yard and then new persimmon trees grow. And then I dig them up and give them to neighbors. So I feel like maybe this is a self-serving argument, but I feel like I'm actually helping by foraging. I'm also helping the tree um, or yeah, I'm helping the tree seeds reach new places that they would never get to otherwise. Um, and hopefully in general, over time, increasing the population of American persimmon in, in my area. Uh, legality, I don't want to get into this, but um, on public land, um, you know, I generally assume that if it's something like a fruit, um, you can take, you can take the fruit. It's not going to harm the plant itself. Um, but if, if you're, if you're talking more about like taking leaves off a plant, um, you, you do probably want to educate yourself on the rules and every, every type of park or natural area has a different set of rules. It can often be very hard to find these rules. My interpretation of that is that the, the agencies that manage these places often, they're not thinking about foraging. It's not even something that crossed their mind. Um, in terms of human uses of the space. And they're certainly not trying very hard to, to kind of let us know what the, the rules and guidelines are. Um, I wish they would, you know, when you go to a park and it says like, you know, the rules like no bonfires, don't be here after dark. I wish they would also include what, what can we eat? I think that would be really useful and also get people thinking more about foraging. Um, this is my last point. I one thing I've noticed is, especially online, when I post something about foraging on Facebook, I almost inevitably somebody or multiple people say, you shouldn't forage from anywhere other than your own yard because the wildlife need all the, the food. Um, so we sort of have this scarcity mindset that there's just not enough out there. Um, and, and so...
you know, I, I think this is, you know, I, I object to this mindset, as you can probably tell. First of all, if, if we restrict foraging to private land, that means most people won't get to forage at all because many, many people live in apartments or other sorts of dwellings where they don't have access to land. Um, so it kind of like, it's, it's kind of a privileged thing to even be able to consider foraging on private land. Um, but secondly, we waste the vast majority of our public space. So just, these are spaces, they're all in Mount Rainier or Northeast DC. I just took these photos over the last day. A whole bunch of huge lawns, complete waste of space, could all be completely filled with edible plants that we could all be foraging from. So we don't lack space. Um, and, and this is, I, you know, obviously I'm in a densely populated urban environment. So if we were in a less dense environment, there would be even more space. We don't lack space, we just lack imagination and knowledge and just people being motivated to actually make good use of space. So let's fill our world with beautiful edible plants and we can all be as happy as this girl in the Mount Rainier food forest looking at a blueberry. And that's the end of my talk. Sorry, I had to... You're uh, muted again, Lisa. You're muted. You're, you're still muted. I unmuted myself. There Are you go. trying to unmute mute me, Nair Carter? No. So... Uh, so there were some questions early on in the uh, in your talk, which I'll go back and get. Do you want to just have people raise their hands on their pictures? You know, raise their hands, and they you could call on them, or um, you know, we can just ask them to put their questions in the chat. I will say that there a lot, a number of people have put a lot of very useful information about. Um, uh, native plant places and plants that are um, that are perennials, et cetera, in the chat. So people may want to make copies of the chat before they leave the the meeting. Okay. Oops. I'm 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 fine either way. I don't have a preference. Okay. Does anybody have some questions? Raise your hand, and I'm going to go back to the chat and look. Um, I guess one thing that that I would maybe add more than a question is um, I know there in Hyattsville, uh, at least service berries have been planted pretty extensively as, over the years um, in the uh, the neutral ground between the sidewalk and, and the street. And, uh, you know, I have seen some where they get hit with the fungus or something, but I know my, my daughter loves uh, grabbing those and uh, eating them as as walk through the city. And then mulberries, which are invasive, aren't they? But they uh, they seem to to be quite prolific for a week or three. Yeah, well, we have a native mulberry um, that's really delicious. And then there's also a, a much less delicious invasive mulberry. Mm. But yeah, those are those are two great uh, fruits that are, are really abundant for about three weeks, um, kind of overlapping periods in the spring. Um, I, yeah, it is unfortunate about the, the service berries. I, I feel like it could be, they, they could be even so much more than they are, except that they get this fungus, which grows, it has this interesting life cycle. It starts out on, uh, it's called the cedar apple rust. And part of its life cycle is on, what are often called cedar trees, they're actually not cedars, they're junipers. Cedar is a different genus, just to be <laughs> pedantic about it. But um, it starts out on juniper, and then it finds its way to something in the apple family, um, which includes service berry. And so, you know, if you go out and look at service berries now, I, I think pretty much any fruit that wasn't picked by a person or a bird is, is covered in the fungus at this point. Um, that's just, you know, part of, part of our ecosystem. But if, if you go out kind of earlier 
when the service berries are just turning ripe, you can gather a lot. Like we gathered several quarts worth uh, earlier this spring. I see one question in the um, chat, which actually I asked, which, and I'm thinking about the, um, the community gardens that we have here in Hyattsville. Um, uh, can you have a food forest without trees? I mean, without large trees, can you use, can you plant other things, lots of different plants um, that would support each other, but not be, you know, not, uh, and support obviously wild, wildlife. I don't see why not. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I do think there's a little bit of a tension between trees and, and community garden, right? Because over time, if you plant big trees, they're going to grow up and, and cast a lot of shade and, and you're certainly going to lose uh, productivity in your vegetable beds. They're just like, you know, there's only so much sunlight to go around. And, and if, if the trees take most of it, then your, your vegetables are going to suffer. So, yeah, I, I think there was actually an earlier proposal to do a community garden in the park we ended up using for the food forest. And I never thought that was a good idea because actually that park is already quite shady due to these mm -hmm. large white oaks on the southern border. Um, so I think a food forest ended up being a much better use of the space. Mm -hmm. But if we were going to, um, we would just diversify the uh, the plants that we're planting, not just our for for our own food, right? But you know, for butterflies and other animals. Yeah, and I mean, lots of shrubs, you know, edible shrubs can be grown that that are, will never get that big and mm -hmm. won't, won't create those same issues with shade. Okay. I see Sandra has her um, hand up and she's put a lot of information in the chat, a very useful information, I think, about perennials, et cetera. And where did, did Sandra, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, first of all, if none of you know about Doug Tallamy, um, you should. Um, just look him up online and he'll tell you a lot about native plants. Um, my, I had cancer, and so the last two years, my garden has been overgrown with invasives, and it was a pollinator and native plant garden just a little while ago. Um, I have a lot of work ahead of me, but um, I was just, there are two things. You named a Asian name, I think, for cutleaf coneflower. It's actually an indigenous name. I'm sorry. It was an ind it did sorry indigenous right. name Sochan. How do you spell it? Can you put that in the chat? Spell it. Yeah. Just in the chat would be great. And the other thing is, um, you talked about wood sorrel, and um, it looks to me like plain old weedy oxalis. And I've always, any time I've tasted it, it's been so uh, not acidic, but it dries out your tongue and whatnot. And somebody else put in that they actually make pesto out of it. And I want to know, are they the same variety of sorrel? I think so. Yeah. I, I think oxalis is the genus name. Yeah. Yeah. The, or the um, species or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and I actually was out in the redwoods recently and I saw it, a, a plant and I was like, that's, that's gotta be uh, some kind of wood sorrel. And I looked it up um, and it was, so I, I ate a little bit of it. Um, even it's like a, a Western version that looks quite different from ours. Yeah, uh, I grew up in California, so it's a little bit different. But I just yeah. put some this morning when I put out a zucchini plant. So now I feel guilty because it's already in the weeds, in the bag for real. <laughs> oh, it's okay. There'll, there'll be more. It'll come uh, back, yeah. And I do think you don't want to eat like an infinite amount of it because it produces this oxalic acid, which is not good for us. So yeah, it's one of those that you want to kind of use sparingly. I see Becky has a question here. Becky, are you? Yeah. Hi, Lisa. How are you? Yeah. Uh, Li Livingston here. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is a really nice program. Thanks for putting it on. Um, there was mention about the creeks that have been covered over. That was done in the 50s and before Hyattsville, Mount Rainier, wherever partially in response to um, controlling mosquitoes because of polio outbreaks, just for mm -hmm. what it's worth. And 
Is it illegal to tap a fire hydrant? Because there was mention of that. Um, that's a good question. We, I mean, it wasn't illegal for us because we had the city's permission, but oh, okay. Yeah, if you don't have, pro probably is. If you need, you need special tools, I don't think it's something that most people would be able to do. Yeah, uh, I was just curious because it could take a while for a fire hydrant, or excuse me, a fire department to hook up <laughs> if uh, if that's done that way. Yeah. And, uh, I think that's that's it, but I thank you very much. You're welcome. I noticed the question in the chat, what is the etiquette around harvesting in the food forest? I mean, it, you know, it's a kind of an interesting question because the truth is we haven't really produced that much food yet, at least not like food that most people are gonna recognize as food. Um, like there is plenty of that sochan, but that's such, such an obscure food. Um, for us, I mean, it's not obscure for Cherokee native people, but um, sort of for people who live in this area, I, I doubt even 1% of the population recognizes it as a, as a food. So it's, it hasn't really been an issue because just because of like what, what's, you know, what's growing there and what's actually available. But I am starting to see apples and pears and sort of more kind of recognizable foods starting to be produced this year. So it, it will be interesting. I think, you know, we're just gonna have to see how, how things go. Like if I, if it seems like in, individuals are just coming and grabbing every, every single thing and leaving nothing for anyone else. I mean, in a way there's like nothing we can do about that, but hopefully we could maybe put up some signage at least encouraging people to, to not do that. I don't, I, you know, I don't know about the, Hyattsville does have two food forests, and I don't think it's run into that kind of a problem in terms of somebody, people walk, walking off with all of the fruit that's there, all of the, I think, so there's been some disappointment <laughs> if people got there off season and didn't find anything, but. Um, yeah, I mean, you have, you have to be realistic, like trees take years to grow and start producing anything. And even when they start producing, it's probably going to be small amounts for a while. Um, so yeah, you're not going to put in a food forest and then next year be, you know, churning out lots of food. Right. There was a question early on about other than asparagus, what other perennial vegetables are there? Sandra um, answered rhubarb, fennel, strawberries. I added rosemary if it overwinters. <laughs> and some other, you know, lavender, things like that. Um, are, are there other things that you would add? In terms of like, I guess our normal, what we normally think of as vegetables. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, there's some, some herbs, like a, a lot of our herbs are, are perennial. Sunchokes are perennial because you never get all the roots, but they will take over. Yeah, we actually planted the plant are also edible. It's a sunflower. It's beautiful. Yeah. We we planted. Uh, is sunchoke the same as Jerusalem artichoke? Yeah. yeah, we planted that, and I think we may may be regretting it. <laughs> <laughs> there was a question about. Um, from Nicole Ventura, are muscadine grapes native to here or just further south? Mm. I don't know. Does anybody know? Sandra, do you know? I, I know I've found them as far north as Massachusetts, but I haven't really seen them around here. Hmm. But they'll grow around here. I think so. I, I just, for whatever reason, they they aren't in the uh, the environment at the moment. That's something, yeah, we don't have grapes in the food forest and we should, <laughs> something to think about. I have grapevines if you wanna take cuttings. Okay, actually we, I do have some in my yard. Mm -hmm. I guess I Florida to the New Jersey coast, according to the web. Yeah. I don't, you know, we, we certainly have not worried too much about nativeness. I, you know, obviously we're not gonna grow anything that's a recognized invasive species but um, I think, you know, if, if your goal is to produce food for people, um, you know, if, if you limit yourself to only what's native in 
Maryland, um, you're, you're going to be missing out on a lot of things like great stuff like apples and, and so on. Um, so yeah, my personal opinion is, you know, it's worth knowing what's native and, and maybe, you know, trying to get a lot of native plants growing, but certainly not being exclusively native. I don't see other questions. Are there other well, questions from people? Yeah, just uh, um, one thing. I know that like some of the other things that I've encountered um, just through the Northwest Branch Trail, um, which public lands, but I've definitely harvested a few things there. Um, pawpaws, um, they are pretty prevalent in and out. Mm -hmm. And then there's um, like a purple passion flower, uh, passion fruit type thing, which I had no idea what that was until I was at... Um, at Eco City Farm one day, and they had it growing up on a fence, and I uh, got to take a few. Those are, and it's crazy because it's, you, know, you think of it as being a tropical fruit, but it's completely native to our area and grows along like that uh, levee trail um, that runs through Brentwood. Um, so mm, there, there's a lot of cool stuff that's out there, um, and it's it's fun to to be able to explore it and and stay away from the mushrooms. <laughs> there are figs, uh, fig trees along the bike trail in, in Driscoll Park going, going, I don't know what's, going towards um, Queens Chapel Road uh, in that area where just beyond where the, um, the playground is. Yeah, I just wish things would grow a little faster, like, like the pawpaws. They're so yeah. slow. We planted them three years ago and they're still like yeah. feet tall and you know it's just hard to I, I want people to be enthusiastic about the food forest but you know when people ask like when are we going to get pawpaws I'm like well maybe in 2030 it's, just, <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to keep people excited you <laughs> hard to keep myself excited sometimes when it's such a long time horizon go ahead Sandra Purple passion flowers, almost every part of it is edible and it is native. Wow. Pawpaws, like persimmons, need a mate within 10 feet. And um, actually, I have a friend of mine in Akakik who would love to dig up and give you a pawpaw tree. <laughs> um, and there's a woman, I'm in Greenbelt, and I'm in... 14 Court of Laurel Hill Road. And we have one of the Greenbelt Co-op uh, experts on plants lives in my court. And she's actually um, started lots of big cuttings over the years. And if you get in touch with me, um, I can get you in touch with her and she'd probably give you a fig tree. I have two fig trees that I grew from cuttings in my yard, two different kinds, and I have to tr trim them back every year or else I can't reach them. So if anybody wants fig cuttings, I will be doing fig cuttings again in um, probably December, January. Yeah, when, I'd be when, pleased to give some to Mount Rainier's food forest if you would like yeah. some. <laughs> we, we, do, we do have a fig, but it's not doing well i think it's too shady to be honest like fig, figs like sun yeah Mediterranean. My, the one that grows the best in my, has grown the best in my yard it is against my the back of my house uh and gets afternoon sun so one thing i just think about is that um you know i'm just like looking out from my from my house and for all the kind of interest there is nowadays in native plants and edible plants i still feel like it's really kind of a niche type of landscaping. And in our area, like if we want more of this kind of landscaping, we either need to be working with public agencies, cities and so on that own land, um, schools, churches mm -hmm. own a lot of land, at least in Northeast DC, the church, churches dominate a lot of the open land. And, and then just people, and I'm just always thinking about like, why aren't more people doing this and how can we sort of sell, sell the idea better? Um, Cause I don't know, to me, it's just, it would be so much better if everybody was growing native and edible plants and than mm -hmm. just lawns. That's my opinion. Um, I don't know if anyone has any ideas. 
I don't see a lot of other questions. Carter, maybe you could take a lot of what's in the um, the you know the informational uh, posts that are in the uh, the chat and put them send them out when you send out the video. Yep, definitely. And I don't know if people there are any other last questions. If not, we'll just thank Gabe for coming today and for for doing this. This was really fun. I really enjoyed it. Good. Um, yeah. Uh, and I am trying to replace many of the plants in my yard with natives slowly, slowly, but yeah. Um, yeah. Um, sure. yeah. So um, thank you everybody for coming. We generally close around 3.30, so we're right on time. I just want to uh, say coming up next, well, before just to say that we will send out the video from this uh, in about a week. Uh, or within the week, and Carter will include a lot of the notes that were um, in the in the chat. Um, coming up next month on July 22nd, we're hosting a session with Yoruhu, an African American quilt guild, uh, with Renee Anderson and others of the quilters who just had an exhibit at Brentwood Arts Exchange. Um, we're looking forward to that. I hope to see a lot of quilts at, at that. Um, and, have them talk about their the formation of their group and um you know that i think it's in a, it's across the country so there are people from all over so thank you very much everybody and um i think that's it thank yep. you thanks gabe